when he was defending Taweed and his essential defence was, I don't know, 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 I said I would use the same defence. How does the son pray to the father? I don't know, but in a way that befits God's glory. Who will be given the ability to judge the, diff the 12 tribes of Israel? The 12 tribes of Israel, that means all the Jews, will be judged by the apostles of Jesus Christ. I'm sure Moses will be disagreeing with that and so will all the Jews today. Even if he proves to me individually that the Father is God and the Son is God and the Holy Spirit is God, you still haven't proved that these three are one being. In a chapter that has tens of words, in a book that has hundreds of words, in a collection of books that have thousands of words. And he wants you to focus on just four. This is called a red herring argument. Can Hashim say to Allah, glorify me with the glory I had with you, Allah, before the world was? And if he can't, why not? Can I, can I get, can I, I mean, can I get a bottle of water? Will someone grab me one? Yeah, right. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. So what's your topic? Okay, so my topic is with regards to the belief of Jesus Christ and about these. So basically atonement, all this relates to Jesus Christ. So atonement and the belief of Jesus Christ. Do you want to wait for your water? You want to no, 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 we can stop. So, wait, yeah. wait we, need, we need the timer. Two minutes? Yeah, two minutes each. I think that's, good. that's good, yeah, right? Yeah, two, two minutes, minutes is fine. Now, at uh, the last one, well, actually, we just did it by yeah. now, yeah. So. so let us start the topic, inshallah. So yeah, okay, my question, first, my question to you, Bob, wait, 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 we're not got time yet. No? Right, three, two, we start talking. Who, who starts? I'm sorry. Yeah. You two, why is it tired? No, my battery is not. Before this stage. Okay, so my question to Bob is, when Jesus, when Jesus was here during his ministry on earth, yes, you believe that Jesus Christ is fully God. I don't know if you do, but I don't want you to claim that I'm making uh, claims about your belief, but. Christians I've heard say that Jesus is fully God and fully man. Now this fully God and fully man obviously wasn't an atheist. Yes, when he came to earth, he was preaching to the people about God Almighty. He was not someone who was teaching a false belief. He was teaching the truth. When Jesus was on earth, what did he teach the people? Did he teach them about a Unitarian God or a Trinitarian God? So for example, when Jesus says, I go to my God and your God, and when Jesus acknowledges in John 7 and 3, yes, you can go to John 7 and 3, 4, 5, I don't mind. Yes, because many people claim that I bring up this John 7 and 3 all the time and then disregard the rest. Bring in the rest of the passages, no problem at all. But do not, do not say, oh sorry, do not, do not evade the question, which is when Jesus said that this is eternal li life, that they know you, yes, the Father, he is referring to you as the Father, that they know you, the Father, the only true God, yes, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Did Jesus Christ recognize a Unitarian God in the Father, or did he actually advocate a triune God to anyone? And if he did, please show us where. If you've got something explicit, that'll be great. If not, please show us what proof you have. That's fine. So you said your next for you. Charity, just hold that please. Okay. Three, so, two. My so ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank Hashim because he wants to do a Bible study and I welcome anyone who actually wants to do a Bible study with sincerity. Unfortunately, personally, I doubt his sincerity because for the camera he went and said, oh, you, I don't know if you believe in the Trinity. I've debated the Trinity with him twice already. He knows full well I believe in the Trinity. So why did he make that comment? Fully God, he did the that Trinity. for you guys. Answer he did that for the audience. Answer He's playing. Stop Listen. interrupting Hashim and keep I'm your cheerleader <laughs> quiet. Thank you very much. So let's talk about John 17. Let's talk about it properly, sensibly and intelligently. I won't get through everything I need to say in my remaining minute. So we'll just talk about the bit that he wants to. It says in this scripture that you gave him authority over all flesh. That's the father has given the son authority over all flesh. Tell me Hashim, which prophet has authority over all flesh or is that the prerequisite of God alone? Then it goes on to say, Father, the hour has come Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. So we have two people glorifying one another. But God is glorifying Jesus and Jesus is glorifying 
God, what the heck is going on there? Think about that. Why is God glorifying a man? And how can a man glorify God? Is that glory the same? That's an important question because we'll come on to that later. I've got eight seconds. You haven't answered the question. Yet. No, I'll come to it. I'll come to it. In three seconds? Not, no, I'll have to do it in the next two <laughs> so minutes. So you admit you didn't answer the question, good. Now, the question I asked him was very simple, yes? I asked him, where does Jesus advocate a triune God? Or did he claim very clearly, like in John 17, 3, explicitly saying that God Almighty is the Father and he is the only true God? He hasn't answered the question. Now, remember the question? I asked him earlier that this was, when I asked you to clarify was with regards to whether Jesus was fully God. Not that you believed in the Trinity. So you have a problem hearing somehow, I don't know. I said, I don't, I don't want to put it in the mouth. I want you to clarify whether you believe Jesus is fully God. If he's fully God and fully man, this fully God and fully man himself is saying that the only true God is the Father. Now that clearly is a contradiction. If there's only one God, yes, if there's only one God, and that one God, I don't know which one it is. Is it the Father, Son or the Holy Spirit? I'll leave that problem to you because that's your domain. If there's only one God, then the only when Jesus says the only true God should be that one God. Yeah. Am I right? If I'm not right, please clarify. With regards to the glory, when you glorify someone, you don't become the same glory as them. So if someone glorifies the king, you will become the king. So it's a completely misunderstanding from Bob's point of view. Just because Jesus glorifies God and God glorifies him doesn't make the glory equal. Why would Jesus be asking God for glory if he was God indeed? Imagine a God asking somebody else for glory. What does that, imp uh, that, what does that imply? That he himself doesn't have the glory, so he has to ask God for the glory. God, please give me the glory. That is what he's asking. This is a prayer of Jesus. You pray to whom? To someone who can provide you, who can answer that prayer of yours. The reason Jesus is praying in the first place to a higher being shows you that he himself cannot fulfill that wish of his to even give him the glory imagine a god asking for glory Time. Go. so hashim has talked a lot about glory and it is said he didn't he didn't address my point the father said to the son or the son said to the father that he has authority over all flesh tell me does allah have authority over all flesh or does one of allah's prophets have authority over all flesh if Jesus is saying that the Father has given him authority over all flesh, then what does that make Jesus? That's a good question for you, Hashim. But then he talked about glory. Let's just look at this a little bit more because it's relevant to the passage. What does it say? Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself. So we now know what kind of glory we're talking about. We're talking about divine glory glory Perfect. that's the glory we're talking about and Jesus is saying glorify me with yourself in other words make me a partaker of the glory that you have but listen to what comes next glorify me now father with the glory which I had with you before the world was so in other words before all of creation Christ was glorified with the Father. Which prophet can say that? So when Jesus says, you are the only true God, he then in the same phrases, in the same dialogue, gives himself equality with the Father. So in answer to your question directly, Jesus is teaching a Trinitarian view of God. And we can go on to the Holy Spirit shortly because Jesus does talk about the Holy Spirit. Okay, so remember, he made a complaint when I was having the discussion with regards to the Tawheed, even though there wasn't much about Tawheed in, there, in that uh, dialogue. But he said, not with regards to a particular bracket that I used, where in that passage that you read does it say it's the same divine glory? This does not say divine glory anywhere. So Bob is being disingenuous by saying divine glory when he's not saying divine glory. Remember the question I asked him, which he still hasn't answered, is was Jesus addressing the people when he was talking to them? Was he talking about a Unitarian God? This, he clearly says in John 17, 3, the only true God, which he still hasn't answered. Why does Jesus say the only true God is the Father if the Holy Ghost 
and Jesus is also the true God. He clearly says that there is one entity, one person, or if you want to use that term, is Father, who is the one who is the only true God in John 7 and 3. Yes, he says the glory before the world. He didn't say before every creation. I'm sure there were creation before the world was created. Give me the glory before the world began. Yes, neither does it say a divine glory. There are many, I, I believe it was uh, St. Augustine who explained, I don't know how much time you have got. Yeah, you explained with regards to what this means. It means something, what God has already ordained for him in the future. That he's asking for that glory that God has ordained from the beginning with regards to Jesus. There are people about whom God has said before they were born, before in the belly, was it one of the prophets? I forgot, but I'll find out the reference while you're talking. So yes, God ordains things about the future play, 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 and he pressure. says, Let press what? Why are you stopping it? It's 19 seconds. Seconds. 16 seconds. 16 seconds. Can you give that watch to someone else? Because I don't want to be to soak up, if you don't mind. Are you stopping yourself? No, no, what I'm saying is that he's fiddling with the watch while talking. He caught it, it by accident. That. You weren't even looking. He caught it by his thumb by accident and he tried to right, get the time seconds, back. Right, 16 seconds, 3, 2, 1. We're giving you an extra 16 seconds. Stop whinging, carry on. You didn't stop whinging. At least shows the time. That is fair, isn't it? Yeah. So what I'm saying is that do not use your own logic and put it in there like the Pharisees used to do. They used to twist the verses. Yes, I'm not saying you're a Pharisee, but this is what Jesus time. condemned them for. Time. Three, Show us a so, ladies and gentlemen, wait. Hashim's style of argument basically goes like this. Wait, 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 wait. Bob, if you don't mind, can you keep it the time? 60 seconds, I don't know why. Yeah, just can you. It's, it's two minutes, time. two minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Put it two minutes, eh? Yeah. No, no, two, minutes? two minutes? Are you ready? Yeah. You're going to do two minutes? He's yeah, already yeah, pressed yeah. start, though. Press Are you ready? I'm going by your time, not his. Three, two, one, okay, go. So, Hashim's style of argument is essentially this. I want you to focus on these words, okay? Focus on these words. Speaking to the Father, the only true God. The only true God. He wants you to focus on four words in a passage of hundreds of words. Ah, he wants yeah. you to focus on, four, well, hundreds is too many. Decades of words, tens of words. Four words out of tens of words in a chapter that has tens of words, in a book that has hundreds of words, in a collection of books that have thousands of words. And he wants you to focus on just four. This is called a red herring argument. It's called his Sufism. He's saying, magnify these four words and ignore everything else. <laughs> but I've read the rest of the passage to you. Jesus claims authority over all flesh. Hashim. Which Muslim prophet has authority over all flesh? Hashim, Jesus said that he has this glory with the Father before the world was. The word world there is the word cosmos in Greek. Cosmos means everything. Doesn't just mean the planet. It means everything. It's just a Greek way of speaking. And then he misquoted Augustine. He's relying on the fact that some of you in this audience and some of you watching at home are ignorant. The fact of the matter is, Augustine was a Trinitarian. Perfect. He believed in the Trinity. So he's lying about Augustine arbitrarily using the text. Comment on this verse. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honour the Son even as they honour the Father. Time. Okay, Wait. so remember he did not Wait, show us the divine one. glory that I asked him about, which means he concedes that he lied about it. Now with regards to Jesus being given all authority on earth, yes, remember in John 5.30, Jesus says, I by myself can do nothing. Imagine this for a second. You got a God Almighty who has been given all authority. And then the same God says to you that I by myself can do nothing. As I hear, I judge. In fact, he couldn't even answer his own prayer. When he, when he actually fell on his face in the Garden of Gethsemane, he begged God to save him from the crucifixion. I'm, I'm paraphrasing obviously here. What I'm saying is that he said, take this cup away from me. Was that cup, which signifies the crucifixion, taken away from him? His own prayers were not accepted. In other words, they were rejected if he had all authority over all flesh, over everything. Why is he now begging God to fulfill his prayers? What does, what does given all authority mean? It means when you are a prophet, 
when Moses was a prophet, when Jesus was a prophet, when Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was a prophet, they had the authority of the people with regards to, for example, what they should, what is halal and what is haram, what they're permitted to do and what they're not permitted to do. That is the kind of authority we are talking about. Not all authority with regards to even answering the prayers, with regards to Jesus himself, when he wanted his prayers to be answered, he had to ask God, he had to fall like any other man and submit to God on his face and ask God to answer his prayers. Where is the answer to my question, Bob? What did Jesus advocate? Show me something explicit where Jesus says, Yo, you have to believe in the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, the triune God. Why did the church take 400 years, including Augustine? Yes, why did it take so long to establish the Trinity in the 4th century doctrine? 5th century, if you want to talk about the dual nature of Jesus. Time. So ladies and gentlemen, he said I have to show him the divine glory. So I just want you to think like intelligent people, because I know you're all a handsome bunch, so I suspect you're all so intelligent. That, by the way, is called playing to the gallery, which is something that Hashim does a lot. Listen to these words. For not even the Father judges anyone. Did you hear that? Anyone judges no one. But he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son even as they honor the Father. Now Hashim accepts that the Father is God. So let's stick the word Allah to replace the word Father. For not even Allah judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son, even as they honor Allah. Does that sound like divine glory to you? Because it certainly does to me. Now, first, furthermore, it says, Glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Tell me, which prophet could say that? Did Muhammad? Did Moses? Did Isaiah? Did any of the other prophets? Did Obadiah? None of them. Can Hashim say, can Hashim say to Allah, glorify me with the glory I had with you, Allah, before the world was? And if he can't, why not? I would like Hashim to answer that question. I would like Hashim to answer this question. Can he say to Allah, can he say to you, glorify me, honor me like you honor Allah? If he can't, why not? I would like him to answer that question. Jesus is saying he is God. Deal with it, Hashim. Jesus never said he's God. You still haven't given us any explicit verse from the Bible. So please stop being disingenuous. When Jesus has been given judgment, remember the word given. Who gives God the ability to judge? Someone higher than him. The only way possible to be given judgment, yes, and by the way, he said that Jesus is the only one who has been given the judgment to judge. Now let's see if Bob actually reads his Bible. Or does he just shout it around here, trying to convince all the Christians there is a trinity in the Bible when there is no such thing. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, we read, Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. These are not gods. These are not even prophets. These are the apostles, the 12 apostles. Yes, who will be given the ability to judge the, diff the 12 tribes of Israel? The 12 tribes of Israel, that means all the Jews, will be judged by the apostles of Jesus Christ. I'm sure Moses will be disagreeing with that and so will all the Jews today who hear these words. Let's see if the Father has the ability to judge. We read in 1 Peter 1.17, since you call on a father, this is Jesus' words I'm assuming, since you call on a father who judges each person's works impartially, the father judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Fear that you'll be judged by whom? Not Jesus, the father, according to 1 Peter 1.17, okay? Now what about the judging of the angels? by the believers according to Paul. Do you not know that we will judge angels? First Corinthians chapter six, verse three. So there you go. The apostles judge. Time. The, okay, that's fine. 
other than the final. So ladies and gentlemen, Hashim didn't answer my question. But each of you can answer the question for yourselves. Can you say to Allah that glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world was? No, you can't. And why can't you? Because you're not God. Notice Hashim didn't address that. Perfect. You can't say to Allah, you can't say to Hashim, can't say to everyone, honor me as you honor Allah. Why not? Because he's not God. That's the answer he doesn't want to give. That's the answer he doesn't want to state openly. Because Hashim is a good debater. It's just a shame that he's not a good Bible student. He's a good debater, but he's not a good Bible student. He said to me, show me where Jesus shows the Trinity. We've already seen that Jesus calls the Father God, and we've now seen where Jesus calls himself God. But here's something else that Jesus said. He says, all manner of insult and blasphemies against the Son of Man shall be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, that blasphemy shall never be forgiven him. Now let me ask you this question. Can you blaspheme a man? Can you blaspheme a man? And is blaspheming a man worse than blaspheming God? Jesus said that a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit can never be forgiven. He's put the Holy Spirit on the highest pedestal possible, higher than the temple, higher than any of the prophets, even higher than himself. How then other than can we conclude that Jesus is teaching that the Holy Spirit is also God? Perfect. He asked me to show him, where does Jesus teach the Trinity? I have. Right. So. Once again, Bob hasn't answered any explicit statement. Remember, the Trinity is not three persons or three entities only. It means the three are one being. That is what he has to prove. Even if he proves to me individually that the Father is God and the Son is God and the Holy Spirit is God, you still haven't proved that these three are one being. He has to explain to us why has Jesus acknowledged explicitly in John 17:3 that the only true God, and Bob will not answer this question, show me anyone other than God the Father in the Bible who has got this title of the only true God. Even Jesus doesn't have this title. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost as you call him, does not have this title. The only true God is a title which is exclusive to the Father only because the Father is the one true God who is the one has been spoken in the Old Testament. You don't find in the Old Testament the Trinity. You do not find the Jews worshipping a Holy Spirit or a Son of God whose flesh as God Almighty. Even Jesus Christ himself worshipped only a Unitarian God. The, the bit that he doesn't want to address. The one true God in John 73 is so explicit. And it's, it was so troubling to St. Augustine, if you think I'm misquoting him, go and find out. St. Augustine actually wanted to change the words. Yes? That you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Yes? He, changed, he wanted to change that. He wanted to bring Jesus Christ before the only true God. The Father and the Christ as the only true God. And this is clearly troubling one of their mightiest father, church fathers, St. Augustine. Why was it troubling? Because it's clear when Jesus said that explicit statement that the only true God is the Father. It's clear. Yes? Now, if you want to dabble into the glory of God, that's up to you, but to answer Fine. the question about the Trinity, that's the topic. So, ladies and gentlemen, we heard a concession from Hashim. Did you all pay attention? I hope you were. He said, even if you can show me that Jesus is God, and that the Holy Spirit is God, and that the Father is God, you can't show me that they're one. Yeah, he said that. That's what he said. Did you hear that? Yeah, you yeah. all heard that? That's what he said. So he's admitting. He's admitting that the Bible does show that the Father is God and that the Bible does show that the Son is God and that the Bible does show that the Holy Spirit is God. Thank you, Hashim. This is what happens when you really study the Bible. So now, let us show him that God is one, that there is no other God and that there is no other God worthy to be worshipped. Why is that important? Because if there is only one God worthy to be worshipped, and there is no other God, then that means 
when it says the Father is God and the Son is God and the Holy Spirit is God, we're not talking about three gods. Excellent. And if it also shows that God is one within himself, then that means that when it identifies the Father as God, the Son as God and the Holy Spirit as God, that they are one, one God. So let's show that. How long have I got? Seven minutes. I'll try to do this quickly. I might have to spill over in my next two minutes. Who has performed and accomplished it, calling forth the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, am the first and with, and with the last, I am he. I am he. This is a reference that Jesus uses to refer to himself as the first and the last. It also says in the book of Isaiah, which is the passages I'm quoting, I'm going to have to go into my next session to do this. I'll have, to, I'll have to do it in the next session. Right, so he's going to Isaiah instead of answering a clear-cut question. Where did Jesus preach or advocate the triune God? He still hasn't answered that question. This is like the fourth session or something. And he's still, at, he's basically evading that question. Now, he, he said that I am admitting that they are fully God. Sorry, their father is God, son is God, Holy Spirit is God. I did not say that. I use the term if. Yes, please pay attention, Bob. You've done this many times. You have misquoted me. I said, even if you show us from the Bible that the Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and the Son is God, that still does not answer the main question that these three fully gods, remember the three fully gods are one being. Because I'm asking, is Jesus a being? Of course he is. Is the, is the, is the, is the Holy Spirit a being? Yes, he's a being. And so is the Father a being. So now you've got three beings in one being. <coughs> Does it make sense to any of you? Absolutely not. Because this is incoherent. The reason it is incoherent, the reason Jesus never thought this explicitly, which is the reason he's unable to answer the question I asked at the very beginning, where does Jesus teach everyone to believe and worship one, one God, which, is, which consists of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? Not one verse from the Bible did he quote so far to show us this. He showed us that the Holy Spirit is the one who cannot be blasphemed. So let me get this right. The three are equal, the Father is equal to the Son, they are all co-equal, remember? Why is it that one can be blasphemed and you can never be forgiven even with the blood of Jesus Christ? So even the, even the blood of Jesus Christ cannot redeem you from that blasphemy. But if you blaspheme the Father, yes, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, sorry, the, uh, the, the Son, then you can be forgiven. You have redemption against that. However, the Holy Spirit is not co-equal. He is much higher authority. Like he said, he's put at the highest pedestal. So they are not co-equal even by your own theology. So, in reply, we're talking about the fact, remember Hashim said, he conceded that the Father is God, the Son is God and the Holy Spirit is God. If the scriptures teach that, he said, but where does it show that they are one being? Jesus was a Jew, he was speaking to Jews, he was using the Old Testament. What does the Old Testament say? He says things like this. Have I not long since announced it to you and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me? Or is there any other rock I know of none? So there's no other gods. So if Jesus himself identifies himself as divine, because he has authority over all flesh, he receives divine glory, as we've demonstrated from John, and he says that the Father is the only true God, so he's identifying the Father as God, and he says, not only can you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, but to blaspheme the Holy Spirit is the worst possible transgression, then Jesus has identified Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as God. Perfect. And the uh, context in which he is doing that is a monotheism. The Old Testament states that there are no other gods. It also says this, a verse that Hashim is very fond of, which is, remember o Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, as in one within himself. And that word one is ekad, which is a composite unity. It's the same one where it says that a man shall leave his house and cleave unto his wife and the two shall be one flesh, ekad. So okay, Father, Son and Holy Spirit are one. Okay.
So not only he has misinterpreted the, the Deuteronomy 6 for the Shema, now if you ask any Jewish person who actually proclaims the Shema twice a day, being one of the, the most holiest of all formulas, doctrines, yes, they will tell you when you use the term Echad along with Yahweh, you will never find anything other than one as a monad, indivisible, unique, one God. The reason Bob here has looked at the term Echad, maybe in a concordance, and he came across this, yes, shows us that the only example he could give is along with another human being. So when two human beings come together, they become one, as in a marriage, for example, yes? He can never show us an example from the Old Testament or the New Testament when the term Echad is used, yes, in conjunction with God Almighty or Yahweh, you will never find a hat mean anything other than one. One means one. So know the difference. When the term Echad is also used in the number 11, do you know that? In the number 11, just like in Arabic, you use Ahad Asher. The same is also true for Hebrew. So the term 11 also cons consists of the number 11. Are you going to say 12, 11 gods? No, obviously not. So do not decontextualize. Do not decontextualize. The passages, especially things like Deuteronomy 6.4, which Jesus repeated in Mark 12.29 about the Shema when he was asked, most important commandment. He never said the most important commandment is the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. He said God is one. Of course Jesus believed God is one. But who is that one God? The answer of that is in John 17.3, which he doesn't want to acknowledge. Jesus himself said the only true God. This title is only used for the Father. The reason Bob was the world will not, never address that is because he knows that he cannot find this title for anyone except the Father. <laughs> Jesus said Nine. the words I speak not of God Nine. my own. Okay, what, one second, sisters. So one second. So Hashim has used a lot of red herrings. I want to point out what a red herring is. A red herring is when the subject is over here and you make everyone look over there. That's, that's a red herring. And here's how he did it. Here's how he did it. He said, show me where Jesus is given the title, the only true God. That's a red herring. I don't have to show that. All I have to show is that Jesus is actually God and he has the attributes of God. If I can demonstrate that, it doesn't matter if the words the only true God are ever applied to Jesus. If he has the attributes of divinity and he's called God and calls himself as God, then he's God. Perfect. That is the evidence. Red herring. Red herring number two, the Echad. He said the only places that he can show Echad are in reference to human beings. Red herring. The fact that the Bible does that doesn't mean that it can't also be used in reference to the persons of the Trinity. That is a red herring argument. Hashim is a skilled debater, but he is a poor Bible student. <laughs> now, he said, how long have I got? 45 seconds. I want to introduce baptism to you because it's relevant to my next verse I'm quoting. The sacraments are the principal way that Christians have celebrated their faith down through history and worshipped God. The sacraments are the way, principal way, that we have engaged with the divine in our religion from the earliest times to the present. That's what the sacraments are. It says in scripture, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. What prophet can say that? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so is that the Trinity? No. Having, three names, having three names doesn't mean that they are one. That is the most absurd argument I've heard from Bob, who thinks he's a skilled debater. He's not only a, a bad debater and a bad Bible reader, but he doesn't even understand. You see how he actually does the one about Echad? Remember I said the only way you can use Echad with God Almighty shows no, a monad. He, he couldn't counter that argument. So he uses some sort of sophistry to basically do away with it. He still has not answered the question which I asked at the very beginning. Where does Jesus teach anyone to believe in a triune God. Yes, he said when he was asked how do we pray, he says, he says the only one that you have to pray to or the only one that he actually said to pray to is a father. Yes, the Lord's Prayer, our Father in heaven. Yes, hallowed be thy name. He didn't say our Father, Son and Holy Spirit in heaven and hallowed be thy name. 
He said one. Why did he say to address your prayer to only one from the Trinity? It's obvious, isn't it? Because even Jesus, when he wanted his prayers to be heard, he prays only to the Father. Yes, we know God is one, but what you have done is you have made a leap of faith from you believing that Jesus is God, the Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God, to then believing automatically that these three are one being. No, they are not. Jesus is not the Father according to the Creed. The Father is not the Son and the Son is not the Holy Spirit. Each are distinct from one another. One can be blasphemed, the other cannot be blasphemed. Yes, one knows the hour. The Father knows the hour, the other two don't know the hour. What does it tell us? That they are not even co-equal in their, in their knowledge. The most important thing is that the Father does not die on the cross, but Jesus did die on the cross. If you think they all are one, then all three, did they die? Answer. Okay. Don't stop my time yet. How long have we been going? 49 minutes. 49 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen. Right, are we ready? Ladies and Are you ready? Go. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to remember something. The principal way that Christians worship their God is through sacraments. That is an indisputable fact. Christians use sacraments as an essential part of worship. And two sacraments are principal amongst them. The sacrament of Eucharist. The sac and the second is the sacrament of baptism. It is through these sacraments that we Christians engage in worship of God. That's what we do. That's just like Muslims going to mosque and bowing towards Mecca. That's our version of it. And the sacrament of baptism is intrinsically linked to who? The Father, who is the only true God. The Son, who has authority over all flesh and will judge you and who shared in the glory of the Father before the world was. And the Holy Spirit, blasphemy of whom can never be forgiven. How is that anything other than Trinity? And how is that anything other than from the words of Jesus himself? Now, ladies and gentlemen, let us go on to some of the other points that he raised. Connected to the Incarnation. We Christians believe that the Divine Logos, the person of the Son, took on human form. That he humbled himself taking on the status of a servant. This is called the Carmen Christi. It's in the writings of Paul. When he takes on human form, that has implications I'll talk about in my next two minutes. Okay, so you mentioned baptism and Eucharist. Do you guys know what is Eucharist? Yes? What's the communion? It's the bread and the wine when we yes. celebrate the death. What is the bread? Bread body. is the body of Christ. The body of Christ. What is, is, what is the wine? The wine represents, represents the, blood the, blood of, of the blood of Christ. So, your most important sacrament <laughs> is eating the flesh of Jesus and drinking the wine, the blood of Jesus. Does it ring a bell with cannibalism? Yes, it doesn't. <laughs> well, maybe you should you should find out if God actually has blood and flesh. The only one who has blood and flesh is a human. So whose blood and flesh are you consuming? That of a human. Last time I checked, cannibalism means consuming the flesh of your own kind, your own species. Our species is Homo sapiens, yes? Now, if human beings consume, this is what your most important sacrament is, then I feel really sorry for you guys because that sounds like paganism to me. Now, why would you not answer the question which I asked several times now, Bob? Yes, you keep evading the question. At least I was fair in my discussion with you. I've answered most of your questions. The ones I didn't know, I said I didn't know. Yeah, well, that but was you, all of them. <laughs> but you, that was all of them. No, it wasn't all of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've answered your question. The ones I didn't know was regards to the hadith you brought up, which I never heard about. Now, which I said, I don't know. But I asked you, where does Jesus teach to believe in the Trinity? Yes, he gave us something about the Great Commission. But he doesn't say that's the Trinity. He says to baptize them. Now, who else was baptizing? John the Baptist. He baptized even Jesus Christ. Does that make him also now some sort of a God? And it was a baptism of fire, of forgiveness, of atonement and fire. Why would Jesus, the God, require baptism by his own creation? That too of atonement and of fire, of forgiveness and of fire. Why? What does it tell us? That he's not God. Time. Bob, Bob. We're just going to change the battery.
we got what, two more rounds? I think we've got two more rounds. No, can we get, no, can we get an hour? We Sorry? We've got two more rounds. No, okay. Can we make it an hour? <laughs> <laughs> to, make it, to make it an hour and to make it an hour. What do you mean so, two more rounds? Wait. To make an oh, hour. Oh, you mean two more rounds? Two more rounds, So You go and then I go, is that it, yeah? You, I go, you go, and I go, you go, done. Oh, I see. But I think because you had the last word on the last one, I should have the last word on this one. So you go twice, one after the other, so you have four minutes. Okay, I go, you go, you go, I go, and I've got the last word. Unless you want to do, no, unless you want to do 2-2 two, two and I just have another 2 Yeah, you do and then I do. Backwards and forwards, alright, we'll do it that way. So, ladies and gentlemen, Christians, it is time to study your Bible and take confidence in your faith. Hashim does this trick all the time. He will present what is truly Christianity in a way as if you should be embarrassed by it. It's a, it's a great debate technique, but it's a poor Bible student. The common Christie is found in Philippians 2. It talks about the incarnate word. It says this. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also have the interest of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped. Case closed. Jesus is called God. Equality with God. But he doesn't grasp it, he becomes a man. Now, if you remember in my first debate with Hashim, when he was defending Taweed, and his essential defense was, I don't know, 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 but in a way that befits God's glory, I said I would use the same defense. So here you go. How does the son pray to the father? I don't know, but in a way that befits God's glory. How does the son not know about the day of judgment, but the father does? I don't know, but in a way that befits God's glory. How does the son die on the cross if he's truly God? I don't know, but in a way that befits God's glory. There you go, Hashim. Tell me, is that a reasonable defense? Something tells me you might have a criticism of that defense. <laughs> and yet Islamic Taweed relies on exactly that defense to defend the idea that you can see Allah, that Allah has a shape. Okay, so now he has, actually he's learning from me, Bob. He's saying, I don't know. But I don't know if he's being sincere when he says, I don't know how Jesus prayed. Actually, if you read the Bible, Bob, it does tell you how he prayed. He put his forehead on the ground and he prayed. And he was crying as so he, he was crying as if blood was coming down from his forehead. So we don't know how he prayed. Yes? Whom did he pray to? His God. Does God have a God, Bob? Make sure you answer that question. Does God Almighty have a God? Because Jesus certainly did have a God. You brought up Philippians. What did happen in Philippians? You said he made himself so he's he's same as God. He's in the image of God, in the form of God. Wasn't Adam in the form of God, in the image of God? Yes, he was. Is Adam God Almighty? Absolutely not. And Jesus said he does not consider himself with e equality with God. Does not consider equality with God doesn't mean equal to God. Yes, read the next verse after that. God gives him the glory. Yes, that he says, name will be glorious. The very next verse, they only read up to six. When you read verse seven, that is when it hits you. That there is a God, Jesus has a God who glorifies him. Yes? That is very clear. There is no one God in the Bible. When you talk about it, that the Christians want to believe in it, there are more than one God. This is called tritheism. That's why I told him that even if you address to us that God is Father and His Son and His Holy Spirit, you have only proved tritheism, which is a polytheistic belief that he believed in three gods. You cannot jump from three gods, sorry, one, Fully God, Father, fully God, Son, fully God, Holy Spirit, straight to one God. You either believe each one is fully God, like you said in Philippians, what did he empty by himself? He emptied his divinity. Can you believe, can you imagine a God without his glory and without his divinity? This is an empty I'm... God. So, so ha Hashim complains that I don't answer the question. Notice that Hashim did not answer my question so I'll ask him again, and in his last two minutes, maybe he will bother to do so. Hashim, Jesus said, honor me as you honor the Father. You all recognize the Father as God, so let's say that in Islamic terms. Jesus said, 
Honour me as you honour Allah. Can you say that, Hashim? If the answer is no, why can you not say to everyone here, honour me as you honour Allah? Why? Because the way that you honour Allah is with divine glory and it is polytheism to give divine glory to anyone who is not God. And Jesus said, glorify me now, Father, with the glory that I had with you before the world was. Can you say that, Hashim? If not, why not? Two questions for you right there. When Jesus takes on a human nature, all of the things that Hashim would appeal to about him praying, about him crying, about him dying, all of these verses are by virtue of the human nature. It isn't that the divine nature has changed, it is that the human nature has the human nature has been taken on by the divine and by virtue of the human nature the son prays to the father by virtue of the human nature the son goes to the cross by virtue of the human nature knowledge is not within his grasp that is christian theology He's okay. never dealt with it. Right, I've dealt with the Christian theology, you know that well, Bob. You wouldn't have debated with me otherwise. All so, me as... the reason he kept saying the human nature. Remember, the human nature, that's why he didn't know the hour. The human nature, that's why he worships God. The human nature, that's the reason he died on the cross. Who died for you? The human nature. Did God die for you? No, he did not die for you. From the three, who died for you? None of them. The human nature. This is the question Bob will not answer. Is the human nature part of the Godhead? If it is, then your Godhead consists of human nature, a non-divine entity, which means your God is now not pure divine. It has the element of humanity, the element of weakness, the element of something non-God, not unlike God. This is the, the problem you'll be facing, is a cash 22. Either you admit and submit based, based on the Chalcedonian creed that the two natures are always there with Jesus Christ for eternity. That means from the day he incarnated until eternity, he will always have the human nature with him. Is that human nature all the time within your Godhead? If it is not, then admit and concede the fact that whatever human nature died for you is not part of the Trinity. So from the three, nobody died for you. You either have that situation or you believe, keep believing human nature. When we say a person dies, we do not say his good nature died or his bad nature died or his kind nature died. We say the person died. The question is, which person of the Trinity died for you? The second person according to them. If it is not the case, then admit that no one from the three died for you. That is the dilemma. With regards to the glory, yes, with regards to submission in the Bible, it says that the wife has to submit to the husband as one submits to God. So it's not only glory is compared, but even the submission in the Bible is not about the Torah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is the final two minutes of this debate. The fact of the matter is he keeps confusing the persons and the divinity. Christians do not confuse the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. So when he says God is praying to God, he's confusing himself. The Son is praying to the Father. That is Christian belief. At no time does Hashim actually engage with what Christians really believe. He has a series of straw man arguments, red herrings and sophism to try and manipulate Christians who don't know their belief. Perfect. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to deal with the other things that he talked about. The idea that the apostles will sit in judgment over Israel. The fact that we will also share in the glory that the Father and the Son has. In 1 Peter, chapter, sorry, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, it states this, For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature. We Christians believe that the process of salvation is what we call theosis. It is the changing of being 
that is infused with the divine nature so that it is filled with the energy of the divine. He will have a problem with that. However, how else does he explain his hope that he will be eternal? Eternality is an attribute of Allah. Not dying is an attribute of Allah. Continued existence is an attribute of Allah. He hopes that he will live in paradise forever. He will be sharing in a divine attribute. He will be sharing in a divine energy in the same way that a sheet of iron placed into fire takes on the properties of the fire without being fire itself. It glows, it gives off heat, it looks red. It has all the properties of fire, but it is not fire. Perfect. Okay. Is that done? That's it. Done. That's it. All right, Bob. Thanks a lot. Okay, Appreciate that. Yeah. I think we should discuss. I didn't discuss the main thing I wanted to talk about. Yeah, you, you, you Maybe some other time. Halfway. No, I did. I did have uh, discuss a few things. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> well, it was good debating with you. Yeah, yeah. It's, done. it's done now, bro. So, so done, shall bro. we do a wrap up? Oh, well. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to do a wrap up of the debate over here. Hey boy. All right, Bob, what happened there? So we've had two debates with Hashim. Yeah. One was about Islamic Taweed. And I want to compliment Hashim because he seems to be braver than Ali Dawa, for what? sure. <laughs> and, and what we saw in Islamic Taweed is that Muslims want to assert that, this, that there is this barrier between Allah that is uncreated and is not like his creation and does not enter into his creation and the Islamic texts that say exactly the opposite. The Islamic texts say that Allah is in heaven, that Allah descends into the lowest heaven, that you will see Allah and that Allah has a shape and that one of the divine attributes of Allah, his word, is something that was communicated via the agency of an angel to a man and is then transcribed onto a, a, a sheet of created paper with created ink by created hands. Now, the fact of the matter is all of those texts demonstrate that Allah does enter his creation. And there is a disconnect between the rhetoric that Muslims use about their own beliefs and the rhetoric that Muslims use about Christian beliefs and what their texts say. And they can't reconcile that. And the reason why they can't reconcile that is because the Quranic texts are full of contradictions. If Allah is not like anything in his creation, as the Quran says and Hashim quoted, then that means that descending into creation, being seen by creation in a shape, and having attributes that hands on their hands and a shin and eyes, come, destroys that separation. Or at worst, or at worst, it means that human language loses any meaning. Because it says descend when it doesn't mean descend. It says shin when it doesn't mean shin. It says hands when it doesn't mean hands. It says look upon when it doesn't mean look upon. And it says shape when it doesn't mean shape. Which means that the Quran is not communicating anything. Perfect. But the Quran says that it is a clear guidance to mankind. More like a confused <laughs> guidance to mankind. As we saw with Hashim trying to defend it. And the second debate was this. It ended up being about where does Jesus teach the Trinity? And Hashim just wants to look at four words. Four words in one chapter of a book that has hundreds of words. In a chapter that has decades of words. In a book that has thousands of words. Hundreds of thousands of words, actually. And he wants to ignore everything else that that book teaches. Jesus said, that the Father is the only true God. Yes, Hashim, we know. That's what we believe. But then Jesus said that he had authority over all flesh. What person can say that? Isn't that God's prerogative? Jesus said that honor him as you honor the Father or honor him as you honor Allah. Hashim never answered the question that I asked multiple times. Multiple times, can you say that, Hashim? And any Muslim who watches this video, I want to ask you, can you say, honor me as you honor Allah? And if you can't, tell me why you can't. It's simple, I already know the answer. It's because you're not Allah. 
In other words, when Jesus says, honour me as you honour the Father, he is saying, I am God. Worship me. So there you go, Zacchaeus followers and Akmadidat <laughs> followers. Yeah. Jesus said, I am God. Worship me. Now, Jesus then went on to say that the Holy Spirit can be blasphemed. And not only can he be blasphemed, that that's the worst kind of blasphemy. Which means that the Holy Spirit is also being said by Jesus to be God. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus was a Jew. They only believed in one God. And in the Old Testament it says there is no other God and that you shouldn't worship any other God and that God is one within himself. One what? He said, Eckhart is only used about human beings. Did you hear him say that? Of course he did. Well, that's silly because the verse that I quoted was using Eckhart about God. So it is used about God as a composite unity. A composite of what? Of the persons that are identified in the New Testament as God. The Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, and they are only one God. The doctrine of the Trinity is this that there is only one God to be worshipped, that there is not any other gods, and that God is one within himself, and that the Father is identified as that God, the Son is identified as that God, and the Holy Spirit is identified as that God, and that these three speak to one another and they speak about one another, which means that they are persons but not the same person. So the doctrine of the Trinity is that the Father is not the Son, who is not the Holy Spirit, who is not the Father, but they are all one God. This is true monotheism, not tritheism, as Hashim simply chucked out into the Athera as if he was proving anything, but a belief in one God. This is true monotheism, not the confused monotheism of Islam, that says that Allah is a singular unity with hands and shins that can that is not like anything that like his creation but has a shape that never enters his creation but can be seen as and is in heaven and descends into the lowest heaven and rises above his throne Islamic theology is confused because they hold out two contradictory positions. It is not simple Taweed as they like to say. It is not simple. It's mixed up. And when it suits them, they take hadiths and throw them under the bus. They take scholars and throw them under the bus. When it suits them, they believe in scholars and appeal to scholars, like Hashim did. He appealed to the scholars and he appealed to the Tafsir. And then when I showed him a scholar that said that Allah was a bearded man on a green grass, he said, well, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> and when I showed him that it was his own scholars that had said that this hadith was legitimate, he said no. They pick and choose their own authorities just like they pick and choose the Bible. Don't be fooled, brothers and sisters. Don't let them get away with it. But you must learn your own faith and you must learn how to defend it. Don't let them force you into defending something that is Christian teaching from some position of embarrassment. Know your faith, know it well, and defend it with conviction and courage. That's the third debate we've had on the Trinity now. Yeah. Third debate, Hashim. You've lost every time, bro. <laughs> Give it up. Big up, big up. Thank you, Bob.